this class will deal with the gross anatomy of the kidney we will begin with a question a 30 year old male was brought to the casualty with a bleeding stab wound in the left loin there was marked swelling in the left renal angle plain x ray of the abdomen revealed fracture of the 11th and 12th ribs urine showed frank blood now as a first year anatomy student the questions posed to you are which organ specifying the side is injured give the relations of the anterior surface of this organ describe the coverings of this organ what is renal angle name the anatomical structures that are encountered in succession in surgical route to this organ via the lumbar route so by the end of this class you must be able to answer these questions what is the function of the kidney now we all know that the kidney is responsible for eliminating the waste products in our body particularly though that related to protein metabolism in addition to this it is also responsible for maintaining the electrolyte and water balance in addition to this very important function the kidney also acts as an endocrine organ in that it produces hormones the hormones that are produced by the kidney are renin erythropoietin and 125 hydroxy cholecalciferol renin is as all of you know is responsible for auto regulation of blood flow and bp erythropoietin is involved in maturation of the rbcs 125 hydroxy cholecalciferol is an important step in calcium metabolism from the anatomy that you have already learned you all are familiar with the disposition of the peritoneum and the abdominal cavity so all of you know that the kidney is lying behind the peritoneum on the posterior abdominal wall therefore the kidneys are retroperitoneal organs which are bean shaped the hilum of the kidney is directed medially extends from t12 to l3 vertebra you can see that in the second diagram and you can also observe that the right kidney is at a lower level when compared to the left this is because of the presence of the liver on the right side which pushes the right kidney a little down let us look at the axis of the kidney now you can have a longitudinal axis and a transverse axis okay the longitudinal axis that is passing from the upper end to the lower end of the kidney is directed so if you draw an imaginary line joining the upper end to the lower end you can see that it is directed downwards and laterally which means that the upper end of the kidney is closer to the vertebral column when compared to the lower end now if you pass a horizontal line through the hilum of the kidney it will correspond to your transpyloric plane the transpyloric plane was one of the planes that we drew when we divided the abdomen into nine quadrants so from the second diagram you can see the red dotted line that is the transpyloric plane it is passing through the upper part of the hilum in the right kidney and passing through the lower part of the hilum in the left kidney kidneys are not usually palpable okay the kidneys move minimally with regular breathing very minimally okay but you can palpate the abnormal kidney okay now how do you palpate a kidney hmm? the kidneys can be palpated by something or a method called the bimanual palpation so from the name itself it is called as the 
it is understood that it is using both the hands okay by manual palpation means you are using both hands to palpate so you can look in that diagram you can see that the clinician has placed one hand below and one hand above in a supine patient so you will first ask the patient to lie down then you will place one hand below on the posterior abdomen posterior part aspect in the region of the loin the loin is the region of the back that extends between the inferior margin of your rib cage and the iliac crest and the other hand is placed anteriorly in the lumbar region you can see that he has placed his hand in the lumbar region and you will ask the patient to take a deep breath so on deep inspiration on deep inspiration the kidney you will push from below and feel from above okay so on deep inspiration you will do this procedure or you will press and push you can feel the inferior pole of the enlarged kidney uh, coming and touching your or is felt against the fingers so this is by manual palpation and why does the kidney move minimally during respiration it is because it is a sub diaphragmatic organ next we will come to the coverings of the kidney so the kidney is covered successively by four layers from inside that is the one that is covering the kidney most adherent to the kidney to outwards these layers are the fibrous capsule or the true capsule then you can see the perinephric fat then you can see the renal fascia or the fascia of gerota and outermost the paranephric fat so four layers in total fibrous capsule so the fibrous capsule is also called as a true capsule and it is formed by the condensation of the fibrous stroma of the kidney now you must remember whenever we use the term true capsule of any structure we are referring to the condensation of the fibrous stroma of that organ all right so true capsule of the kidney means it is the condensation of the fibrous stroma of the kidney it is easily stripped in a healthy kidney so you can compare this to the screen guard that you use on your phones okay so you can see that once you place the screen guard you cannot really say it is not obstructing your view okay it is tightly adherent okay and you can pull it out with ease and it comes out with one go okay so similarly the fibrous capsule is to the kidney but in a diseased organ what happens is this fibrous capsule gets adherent to the underlying parenchyma so you cannot strip it out anymore it becomes adherent so when you try to pull it out bits and pieces come out now this capsule covers the entire organ okay including the hilum it does not end at the hilum instead it goes into the hilum to line the renal sinuses and the calluses renal sinuses and calluses will be dealt subsequently perirenal fat the second layer outer to the true capsule you have the perirenal fat or the perinephric fat it lies between the fibrous capsule and the renal fascia it is abundant along the borders and extends through the hilum into the renal sinus so you can see it is abundant also in the region of the sinus next is the renal fascia all right the renal fascia has got two layers it has got an anterior layer and a uh, posterior layer now this renal fascia covers both the kidneys and the suprarenal gland 
The anterior layer is an ill-defined layer and is also called as the fascia of taut. The posterior layer is very well defined and is also referred to as the fascia of Zucker candle. Now, you have to trace this fascia both horizontally and vertically. So, side to side, how does it go? And above downwards, how does it go? So, if you trace it horizontally, look at the diagram. You can see the anterior layer and the posterior layer. Now, if you trace it laterally, you can see that the two fascia are fusing. And then they become continuous with the fascia transversalis. Medially, the anterior layer, okay, the anterior layer is passing in front of the renal vessels. You can see the renal artery and vein, alright. So, it is passing in front of the renal vessels and becomes continuous with the anterior layer of the opposite side in front of the abdominal iota and the inferior vena cava. Now, look at the posterior layer. See, you can see it is passing in front of the psoas major muscle. So, the psoas major is covered by a fascia known as the psoas fascia. So, this posterior layer is blending with the psoas fascia and then attaches to the bodies of the lumbar vertebrae. This diagram shows the vertical tracing. So, if you see both the layers, the anterior layer. So, the anterior layer is and posterior. Posterior layer is the one that is adjacent to the quadratus lumborum muscle that you can see in the diagram. You can see the diaphragm. You can see the kidney which is purple. Above that you have the suprarenal gland. Okay. So, the anterior layer and the posterior layer. So, the anterior and posterior layers, they unite above the upper end of the kidney and then they split again to enclose the suprarenal gland and then fuse once again and then goes up and becomes continuous with the diaphragmatic fascia. Alright, so that tracing is important. Okay, so it goes up, splits to enclose the suprarenal gland and then fuses and then becomes continuous with the diaphragmatic fascia. Now see the tracing downwards, the anterior and posterior layers are not joining. Okay, they are going down okay along the ureter and then merges with the fascia iliaca so the facial capsule is actually open inferiorly para renal fat or the para nephric fat it is the interval between the renal fascia and the anterior layer of the thoraco lumbar fascia it is more abundant on the posterior surface of the lower part of the kidney. So, we will come to the parts of the kidney. Okay, So, you have to know the parts of the kidney. Then only you can identify the side of the kidney. Which is very important for your gross practicals. Okay, the kidney will be placed and you will have to identify the side. So, the kidney has got two ends, an upper end and a lower end, two borders, <coughs> a medial border and a lateral border and two surfaces, the anterior surface and the posterior surface. Now, the upper end and the lower end. Okay, the upper end is close to the median plane which we have already seen earlier. So, you can see it is about 2.5 centimeters from the midline. While the lower end is about 7.5 centimeters from the midline. And can you see the middle? That is the hilum. It is about 5 centimeters from the midline. The borders are the lateral border okay, and the medial border. Lateral border is convex. Medial border is got both convex and concave parts. So, you can see the region of the hilum, the middle part, it is concave and either ends are convex. So, the hilum is, we all have seen, it is 5 centimeters from the midline and at the level of L1. L1 is the level where the transpyloric plane passes. 
okay so the transpyloric plane is passing through the hilum from anterior to posterior you should know how the structures are arranged in the hilum of the kidney from anterior to posterior it is renal vein renal artery and the renal pelvis so vein artery pelvis v a t vein artery pelvis renal vein renal artery and renal so posterior most is the renal pelvis this picture shows the posterior relations of the kidney all right so you can see that the upper part is related to the diaphragm hmm? it is related to the diaphragm and the 12th rib okay the kidney is related to the uh, right kidney is related only to the 12th rib okay while the left kidney which is a little higher it is related to both the 11th and the 12th ribs below the 12th rib the posterior surface is related to three muscles so look at the diagram you can see from medial to lateral there are three muscles that are related to the kidney okay these are you have the psoas major okay then you have the quadratus lumborum and most laterally you have the transversus abdominis muscle okay so psoas major quadratus lumborum and transversus abdominis muscle in addition to these muscles there are you can see from the diagram three nerves that are associated with the kidneys on the posterior aspect okay these are the subcostal nerve the ilio hypogastric nerve and the ilio inguinal nerves okay so this actually is lying between the quadratus lumborum and the posterior surface of the kidney all right subcostal nerve the ilio hypogastric nerve and the ilio inguinal nerve so this is the posterior relation of the kidney which is same for both the kidneys so diaphragm medial and lateral arcuate ligament the psoas major with the psoas fascia the quadratus lumborum with the thoraco lumbar fascia and the transversus abdominis muscle with the transversalis fascia the three nerves are the subcostal nerve the ilio hypogastric nerve and the ilio inguinal nerves it's also related to the subcostal vessels now anterior relation okay anterior relation from this diagram itself you can see that it is different for both the kidneys so this diagram is also important so the relations of kidney is important you have you can get a uh, short note also they can ask you simply to draw the diagram anterior relations or posterior relation and they can also specify which kidney they want so anterior relation of the right kidney or anterior relation of the left kidney so you must be thorough with the anterior relations so let us look at first the left kidney okay so you all remember when you studied stomach that the left kidney was one of the structures in the stomach bed okay so you can see the gastric area and what are the other structures that were seen there you had the pancreas you had the spleen yes so the gastric area you have the pancreatic area you have the splenic area the upper pole you have the suprarenal gland okay and lower down you are having the jejunal area and the colic area now on the right side again you have the suprarenal gland now which large structure is there on the right side that is the liver okay so liver so hepatic area then you know that after the stomach comes the duodenum so duodenum is on the right side upper duodenal area and same as the other one but in reverse proportion you have the colic area and the jejunal area so right kidney you have the liver duodenum 
colic area, suprarenal and the jejunal areas. The left kidney is related to the suprarenal, the spleen, stomach, colic, jejunal areas and the pancreas. Now whatever I have marked in P means that it is covered by peritoneum or it is within the peritoneum. Others are retroperitoneal. Now let us look at the macroscopic structure of the kidney. Okay, so if you cut through the hilum, okay, and open up the kidney, this is what it will look like. Okay, so you can see that the substance of the kidney can be divided into two parts. You can see it's very obvious from the picture. Yes, you can see one dark red area and one light red area. Okay. So the dark red area is actually referred to as the cortex of the kidney. Alright. And the dark red area is the medulla. The cortex is made up of the cortical arches and the cortical columns. While the medulla is made up of the pyramids. Okay. So what are these cortical arches and cortical columns? Okay. So you can see that the cortex is having two parts okay so one part is forming an arch over the base of the pyramid and one part is lying between the pyramids okay so the one that is arching okay one that is so you can see see this part okay this part that part is the one that is intervening between the pyramids and this part okay this part is arching over the base of the pyramid okay so this part which is arching is called as the cortical arches and the part that is intervening between the pyramids are called as cortical columns so you have cortical columns and you have the cortical arches. Now this cortical arch plus a pyramid constitutes a lobe of the kidney. Now what is this renal sinus? We referred to it earlier. Okay. So renal sinus refers to the cavity within the kidney and it communicates outside through the hilum. So, when you open into the hilum, the region that you are entering is actually the renal sinus. Okay. Now, the renal sinus contains the renal blood vessels. So, whatever structure is entering and leaving, okay, will all be present in the renal sinus. Alright. So, the renal blood vessels, the nerves, the perinephric fat which we mentioned earlier and the excretory apparatus of the kidney. Yes, so the excretory apparatus meaning the major calyx, the minor calyx, the pelvis and the ureter. Okay, and then the ureter exits through the hilum. So that is the renal sinus. Now, what are the factors keeping the kidney in position? They are the pressure exerted by neighboring viscera. So you know there are a lot of organs. We, we saw the relations. Like, so there were a lot of organs around the kidney and these all contribute pressure to keep the kidney in position. Then the all important renal fascia and the renal fat and the pedicles of the kidney. Let's come to the arterial supply of the kidney. Now the arterial supply of the kidney is important and is also unique. All right. The kidney is supplied by the renal artery which as all of you know is a branch of the abdominal iota. It is a segmental artery that is it supplies the kidney in segments. Okay that is it is not come all art fully it is not supplied. It is not directly supplying an anastomosis. What it is doing is that once it reaches the hilum of the kidney it divides into an anterior trunk and a posterior trunk then from this you have arteries known as segmental arteries arising so if you look at that diagram okay you can see you have 
one artery anterior and one posterior okay posterior trunk the anterior trunk then divides into the apical okay upper and anterior middle and anterior and inferior okay so total of four okay apical superior middle and inferior okay four segmental arteries so if you see the diagram you can see the area of supply okay and the posterior trunk continues singly and supplies the posterior aspect okay so you have a total of five segmental arteries usually now the thing is that these arteries will supply only that segment of the kidney there is no anastomosis between the segments so if one segmental artery is gone then blood supply to that segment is gone okay so that is the importance of the segmental supply of uh, the renal artery now i said that there is no anastomosis between the segments so the sub the regions supplied by the anterior and posterior trunks or divisions of the renal artery will not anastomose okay so there is a region okay on the posterior aspect which is the junction of the area supplied by the anterior and posterior divisions of the renal artery it is junction of the middle two third and lateral one third all right junction of the middle two thirds and lateral one third okay you can see the middle middle diagram okay it is supposed to be a functional a vascular plane there is no blood flow there okay so there will be very little bleeding if you incise in this plane so this is the preferred site for surgical incision to remove renal stones that procedure is called as nephrolithotomy now renal artery okay you must have studied in physiology all right the abdominal aorta gives rise to the renal artery and as we have already seen it divides into segmental arteries now from the segmental arteries lobar arteries arise so you remember the lobes of the kidney yes so to each lobe you have a lobar artery and from that the inter lobar artery can you see that inter lobar artery in between the lobes okay inter lobar arteries now this inter lobar arteries give rise to the arcuate arteries so once again from the abdominal aorta you have the renal artery from that the segmental arteries arise from that you have the lobar arteries okay these lobar arteries divide further into inter lobar arteries the interlobar arteries pass through the cortical columns that is the region which is in between the lobes yes so you have the interlobar arteries now once it reaches the cortico medullary junction each artery divides into two arcuate arteries and this arches over the base of the adjacent pyramids can you see the arcuate arteries in the diagram identify the arcuate arteries so the arcuate arteries you can see they are at the base of the pyramids okay now from the arcuate arteries interlobular arteries arise identify the interlobular arteries in the diagram so you can see that these interlobular arteries lie at 90 degrees to the arcuate arteries okay and it is the interlobular artery that is giving your afferent arteriole okay and forming the glomerulus okay the afferent arteriole which feeds the glomerular capillary plexus okay so can you see this in this diagram also okay 
just go through this diagram you have the renal artery okay then the segmental artery from the segmental artery it goes to the lobes so lobar artery then in between the lobes interlobar artery and then once it reaches close to the base of the pyramid uh, it becomes the arcuate artery and from the arcuate artery you can see the interlobular arteries arising and from the interlobular arteries your afferent arterioles arise and these feed the glomerular capillary plexus okay so till there we are ready okay so it is the outer part now what happens okay now it is supplying the glomerulus now we are going into okay into the nephron all right so the glomerular capillary plexus is very different or unique you all know that that is it is the only capillary plexus in our body that is fed by an arteriole and then also drained by an arteriole okay so you have an afferent and efferent arteriole so, and also the efferent arteriole is narrower than the afferent arteriole okay so this gives us or helps to maintain high hydrostatic pressure okay so then what happens so blood is now we have reached where we have reached the afferent arteriole the glomerular plexus and now it is in the efferent arteriole okay now what is special about the efferent arteriole the efferent arteriole is special because they are beginning from a capillary and then they are going and ending in a capillary right so they begin from the glomerular capillaries and then they end in the peritubular capillary plexus okay so this where are these uh, peritubular capillary plexus they are around the proximal and distal tubules of the nephron i hope you all are familiar with the structure of the nephron so the efferent arterioles from the uh, glomer uh, uh, now come and break up into the peritubular capillary plexus around the proximal and the distal tubules okay then it has the same pathway out as that of the arteries interlobular again reverse okay interlobular arcuate lobar interlobar lobar segmental and then to the renal veins okay so that is the mode of blood flow inside the kidney i hope it is clear okay so basically you have two types of circulation in the kidney okay so one is operating in the cortex okay there it is concerned with the filtration of the blood and the other smaller circulation operates in the medulla which is responsible for the concentration of the urine okay so this is how it is going within the so it has reached the cortex and then again it goes into the medulla i hope all of you remember that the loop of henle hmm, and the uh, collecting duct and are all placed in the medulla so it comes it reaches the cortex and then goes to the medulla okay so that is what i said it has got two types of circulation one in the cortex which is responsible for the uh, filtration of the blood okay and the second one which is taking place in the medulla that is responsible for the concentration of urine so how does this urine concentration take place okay that is how the that is how the uh, that is the function of the peritubular capillary network you can see the arrangement of the peritubular capillary network and you must have already studied in physiology how concentration of urine is taking place within the loop of henle and how this peritubular capillary capillary plexus is playing a role okay so i want you to go through that so this is the uh, flow abdominal aorta the renal artery from there to the segmental artery and from there it goes to the lobes via the lobar artery <clears throat> then between the lobes in the interlobar artery then it reaches the 
cortex cortical arch when it reaches that region it becomes the arcuate artery okay and from there from the arcuate arteries at 90 degrees interlobular arteries are given off it is from this that your efferent arterioles arise and they feed the glomerulus and then you have the efferent arteriole which again ends in another plexus or capillary plexus which is the peritubular plexus from there the blood is collected in the interlobular vein then to the arcuate vein then to the interlobar vein lobar vein the renal vein and the inferior vena cava so uh, before i move on i just want to mention this can you see the uh, nephrons here can you see there are two types of nephrons okay so the lighter portion is depicting the cortex of the kidney and the darker portion is referring on the one part below is referring to the medulla of the kidney so you can see that one is having a loop of henle which is just extending into the medulla and the other one is having a very long loop of henle which is extending all the way down to the in the medulla okay so there are two types of nephrons basically in our body okay so one uh, the first type is your cortical nephron so you can see in the cortical nephron it is basically within the cortex and only a small part is extending into the medulla the second type of nephron you can see that the uh, pct the bowman's capsule are lying lower down it is lying in the cortex itself it is lying in the cortex itself but it is lying lower and it is lying next to the medulla so this nephron you do not call it as a cortical nephron it is lying in the cortex agreed but it is lying at a lower level and close to the medulla so we name it something different you call it as the juxta medullary nephron juxta means near or close to it is latin word which means near or close to so it is called as a juxta medullary next to or near the nef- uh, medulla so juxta medullary nephron now the dex juxta medullary nephron has got a very lo- long loop of henle which is extending all the way down to the down uh, deep into the medulla so the advantage is that the longer the uh, the dictum is that the longer the loop of henle the more the concentrations process of the urine all right so the uh, we said that after the efferent arteriole comes out okay it is going and uh, forming another plexus that is the peritubular plexus so that peritubular plexus is actually related to your cortical nephron okay so what about the juxta medullary nephron in the juxta medullary nephron these vessels they break into straight arterioles called the vasa recta okay so instead of the peritubular uh, plexus okay the one in the juxta medullary nephron is called as the vasa recta all right so that you that is that is the term vasa recta so vasa recta is referred or is used in conjunction with the juxta medullary nephron so same way uh, efferent arteriole not to peritubular uh, plexus it is going to the vasa recta in the case of juxta medullary when we say peritubular uh, uh, peritubular plexus we are referring to the cortical nephrons okay so this is just what we have mentioned all right so this is a renal portal system okay, so what do you mean by portal system so portal system basically refers to any blood Uh, vessel system which starts and ends in capillaries so this is an example of a portal system so this is a renal portal system okay so you have a glomerular plexus for filtration of the blood and which is lying in your cortex and then you have a peritubular plexus which is lying in the medulla for reabsorption so that is what i mentioned earlier two sets of blood circulation 
okay one that is operating in the cortex where you have the glomerular plexus and it is related to filtration and the second one which is operating in the medulla all right involving the peritubular plexus and is concerned with reabsorption or concentration of urine and they are connected by the efferent glomerular arteriole renal vein drains into the inferior vena cava the left renal vein also has got uh, tributaries coming to it they are the left gonadal vein and the left suprarenal vein lymphatic drainage is to the lateral aortic group of lymph nodes nerve supply the nerve supply parasympathetic supply is to the vagus and sympathetics via the renal plexus Uh, 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 root value T12 and L1. That is why when there is pain of renal or ureteric origin, it is referred to the lumbar or the uh, uh, from the lumbar to the inguinal region. Okay, how uh, how you describe it is as loin to groin pain. So lumbar to inguinal or loin to groin pain. That is characteristic feature of renal or ureteric pain. exposure of the kidney from behind now there are you can approach the kidney either anteriorly or posteriorly the posterior approach you draw what is called as the morris parallelogram this is an important diagram for you you must know how to draw the morris parallelogram all right so look at the diagram so what are the landmarks that you see you can see the vertebral column okay t11 l1 and l3 these are the markings all right l1 you should know because that is where your hilum is going to be that is the plane where the transpyloric plane is so that is the region of the hilum t1 to l3 okay now you will draw two vertical and two horizontal lines okay two vertical and two horizontal lines So the first horizontal line is drawn at the level of the spine of T11. Look at the diagram. Horizontal line at the level of T11. The second horizontal line is drawn below at the level of spine of L3. Can you see the diagram? Okay. So one line passing through spine of T11 and another line passing through l3 then you will draw two vertical lines okay the first vertical line is passing or drawn 2.5 cm from the midline the second vertical line is drawn 9 cm from the midline or 7.5 cm from the first line whichever is easier for you to remember okay so you will get two boxes and the kidney will be within these boxes with the upper pole okay closer than the lower pole to the first line a uh, first vertical line okay and if you draw the uh, line through the l1 you can figure out where the hilum of the kidney will be so what are the structures so once you draw this okay when you can once you draw the morris parallelogram okay you will put a skin incision and you are going to try to get to the kidney from the back so what are all the structures that you will cut through or divide or expose to get to the kidney so you must keep in mind the posterior relations of the kidney you must remember the muscles the fascia and all the nerves that were on the posterior related to the posterior aspect of the kidney and you know that they are same on both the sides okay so first you will cut through the skin then the next layer okay please uh, look at the diagram okay so you can see first you will cut through the skin then the superficial fascia okay then you will have cut the posterior layer of the thoraco lumbar fascia and the muscles that are attached to it okay which are they 
they are the latissimus dorsi and the serratus posterior inferior muscles okay then then you cut through the erector spinae muscle can you see the erector spinae muscle after the posterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia you have the erector spinae muscle then you will reach the middle layer of the thoracolumbar fascia after that the quadratus lumborum can you see the quadratus lumborum i hope you have identified the quadratus lumborum once you uh, expose or divide the uh, quadratus lumborum you will come to the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia can you see the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia so these are the structures in order okay from posterior in uh, skin inwards okay that you will have to dissect to approach the kidney from behind so as a surgeon you must be aware of these structures now let's come to the applied aspects renal angle that was one of the questions that was asked remember so you can see the from the diagram can you see the both the sides yes okay now what is this renal angle so this angle is formed between the lower border of the 12th rib and the lateral border of the erector spinae muscle can you see one muscle there so this muscle is on either side of your midline that is called as the erector spinae muscle so between the lateral border of this muscle and the in lower border of the 12th rib okay the angle that is formed is called as the renal angle now this renal angle overlies the lower part of the kidney in the case of perinephric abscess there will be tenderness felt in this region i hope you know the meaning of tenderness and difference from pain pain is what the patient will complain of tenderness is what you elicit so when you examine and produce pain in the patient that is called as tenderness so tenderness can be felt in this area in case of perinephric abscess so you can see the picture you can see the swelling on in the region of the loin okay this is a case of perinephric abscess so can uh, look at this diagram okay can you see the lump and then can you identify the pleura okay so you all know okay from your dissection of the lungs and the pleura you all must recall that the pleura runs horizontally crossing the 12th rib at the lateral margin of the erector spinae muscle so whenever you are incising okay whenever you are incising to drain a perinephric abscess you must always put the incision below the renal angle otherwise you will damage the or cut through the pleura renal arteriogram okay so what is renal arteriogram you are inserting a catheter and can see from the whole body diagram that where is the catheter inserted it's inserted in the leg okay which artery in the leg it is the femoral artery so the catheter is inserted into the uh, femoral artery and then it is going you can see it is going through the external iliac and then it is going to the common iliac and then it is going to the abdominal aorta and then from there it is going to the renal artery okay so you are threading it till it reaches the uh, renal artery and then you insert the contrast media okay and you can visualize so you have seen in uh, the uh, cardiac angiography uh, class uh, how the dye was injected and then uh, visualized okay so you can see the so you can see this in this diagram you can see the aorta is seen and from the aorta two renal arteries are arising so on the right side and the left side just compare where the renal artery is arising from the abdominal aorta on the right side it is very much stenosed so this shows 
So in this diagram it shows renal artery stenosis. Now renal transplantation. Okay. So renal transplantation you do uh, when there is renal failure. Can a person live without kidneys? With one kidney he can survive. If both kidneys have failed the person cannot survive. So for treatment uh, one option is renal transplantation. Okay. So where will you put the new kidney and what will you do with the old one? Okay. So usually what we do is the old kidneys are left there itself. Okay. Because it is observed that there is higher mortality and morbidity when you remove the diseased kidney. So you leave it there itself. Instead you transplant a new kidney. And where will you transplant it now? You can't transplant it to the original location because that kidney is still there. Okay. So you will transplant it retroperitoneally itself but you will put the new kidney in the iliac fossa. Okay. And the hilum is placed parallel to the external iliac vessels. Okay. So now you have three structures in the kidney that have to be connected. The renal artery, the renal vein and the renal pelvis. Okay. So where will you connect them? Okay. Where will you connect the artery, vein and the ureter? The renal artery is anastomosed with the internal iliac artery. The renal vein is anastomosed to the external iliac vein. Okay. And your urinary bladder is directly implanted into your urinary bladder. Ureter is implanted into your urinary bladder. Now all of us are familiar with renal stones. Okay. So renal stones can be small or big. Small ones uh, is usually passed up. But sometimes you can have big stones. Okay. Which can obstruct the calluses. Okay. So, so sorry. Ah, so they can obstruct the calluses. In that case you might have to go in for intervention. Okay. So one of the methods is uh, doing a extracorporeal um, lithotripsy. Okay. So what basically what they are doing? Shockwave lithotripsy. Okay. So what basically they are doing is that uh, you use an instrument to generate shock waves. Okay. From outside. You are not putting it inside the body. From outside the body you are passing shock waves in, uh, into, the, uh, the, into this region. And that will crush the stones okay it will, that those shock waves will pass through the body tissues and crush the stones and then these crushed stones are then passed out normally through urine okay otherwise you can use a nephroscope and then remove it okay segmental resection so segmental resection is based on the principle of the segmental supply of the kidney. So we have already seen that there are five segmental arteries and these arteries supply only that particular segment of the kidney. So if you remove the diseased segment the other segments won't be affected. Okay. So you do a resection of only the diseased part of the kidney. Now there is something called floating kidney. Okay. Now we said or we have seen earlier there were factors that were keeping the kidney in position. Now one of the important factors was the perinephric fat. Right. So in perinephric fat in perinephric fat uh, loss. Okay. So when does this perinephric fat loss occur? In chronic diseases. Okay, so you have seen emaciated persons who are very, very, very thin, who have lost all body fat, okay, which is dangerous, okay. So in these conditions, these uh, perinephric fat will be lost, okay, it is absent. So what happens, the only thing that is now holding the kidney in place will be the pedicles of the kidney, okay, that is the structures that are entering and leaving the hilum, okay. But they cannot hold up the kidney like that. Okay. It cannot bear the entire weight. So what happens? The kidney tends to fall down. Okay. This is called as nephrotosis. 
So the nephrotosis, the kidney descends to a very low level through the lower opening. You know that the uh, fascia of Jarota is open downwards. Inferiorly it is open. So it goes down. The kidney falls down. Okay. So what happened to the pedicles now? The pedicles will get bent. Okay. That is called kinking of the ureter. Kinking of the ureter. So when king is just like you, your garden hose, when you fold the garden hose, what happens to the uh, water flow? It gets blocked, right? So similarly, when kinking of ureter takes place, there is obstruction of urine. And I forgot to mention earlier, when I talked about perinephric abscess, where is this perinephric abscess actually? It is in the region of the perinephric fascia. That is, it is between the true and the facial capsules. Okay. And uh, as again, we know that it is, uh, the fascia is, the facial capsule is deficient. In, it is not fusing inferiorly. Right. So, this uh, abscess, the pus in from this abscess can trickle down and can reach the pelvic cavity. Now, before we end, I want to have a small mention about the artificial kidney or hemodialysis. I think all of you must have heard this term somewhere at some time. What is this hemodialysis or this artificial kidney? So, kidney is not functioning. And so we said that they can do renal transplantation. But not everyone can do renal transplantation. Their health may not allow them to undergo such a major surgery. Okay, They might not get a compatible donor. Okay, Or they might be rejecting the transplant. Any reason. Okay, So they can go in for hemodialysis. Okay, So what is this hemodialysis? So you are artificially doing the function of the kidney that is dialysis the function of the kidney is being carried out artificially it is actually of two types your hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis peritoneal dialysis you know that the is related to your peritoneum and its ability to filter okay now we are concerned now with hemodialysis now, what is hemodialysis? In hemodialysis, what we are doing is we are connecting the patient to an kidney machine, artificial kidney machine. Okay. So, how do we connect? When we learnt upper limb, we mentioned fistula, AV fistula, arteriovenous fistula. Okay. So, here we are going to surgically create an arteriovenous fistula between your radial artery and your cephalic vein. Okay. Why are we doing this? Okay. Why are we doing or uh, making an AV fistula? When you connect an artery to a vein, the blood flow to the vein becomes faster. Okay. The pressure to the vein becomes more. So, this makes the vein stronger and it also enlarges the vein. And then you connect this arterialized vein to your artificial kidney or your kidney machine. Okay. So, blood from this arterialized vein will go to this machine where there is a semi-permeable membrane. And in the semi-permeable membrane, there is exchange of me uh, the, uh, metabolites. Okay, so your, your blood is being filtered. Hmm? And this filtered blood will be returned back to the patient's body via the median cubital vein. Investigations. So, you know the anatomy of the kidney. You know the diseases of the kidney. You must know the investigations that are used to do, help you in diagnosing these conditions. So, you can do a KUB. What does KUB stand for? It is actually a plain x-ray of the kidney, ureter, bladder. KUB. Where the kidney can be visualized as a soft shadow.
IVP. IVP is referring to intravenous pyelography. Intravenous pyelography. So what we are doing here is we are injecting a contrast material via IV root. IV root means intravenous. That means you are injecting this material through a vein. And this will immediately reach the kidneys. Then what you have to do is you have to take x-rays at intervals of 1 minute, 3 minute, 5, 10, 15 and 30 minutes. And then you will ask the patient to void okay, or micturate. And then you will take another film post micturation. So you can see the cupping of the minor calluses. Then you have another procedure called the retrograde pylogram. Okay. So your retrograde, you are doing it in reverse. So here first you, in the other cases you are injecting it into the blood. You are taking the x-ray. You are taking it from above downwards. Okay. But in retrograde, retrograde pylography, you are getting to the kidney in the reverse manner. So where will you first do it? You will take it to the the contrast material is introduced to the ureteric orifice. Okay. So how do you do that? You pass a cystoscope through the bladder. Okay. And how do you reach the bladder? Through the urethra. Okay. So through the urethra to the bladder to the ureter and then to the kidney. That is how it is going. Okay. So uh, uh, you will inject the dye via a cystoscope. Okay. And uh, you will pass a catheter through the cystoscope in the ureteric orifice in the urinary bladder. The other methods are USG, CT and MRI. So this is an uh, x-ray showing IV pylography. This uh, will be kept for your exam. X-rays, we have IVP x-rays which will be kept for your practical exams. Okay, so you can see that the uh, uh, the calluses, you can see the ureter, you can see the major and minor calluses and the ureter that are see, uh, seen here. Okay, so we'll come back to our first question. Let us just look once again, a 30 year old male, okay, just the important points. Stab wound, left loin. So you all know what a loin is, where the loin is now. So there was marked swelling in the left renal angle. Okay, so left renal angle. So you all know what the renal angle is. X-ray, fracture of 11th and 12th ribs. So you know the relation of these ribs to the kidney. And you know why the urine is showing blood. So which organ? Left kidney. Okay, so whenever uh, these organs are asked, you must lungs... Eh? Or any, any organ which is you are having uh, double in your body, you must specify the side. So here you have to write it as left kidney. You will lose marks if you just simply write this kidney. Then relations we have already seen. Coverings we all know. Renal angle I hope it is clear. Okay. And the anatomical structures posterior root. So you must know the Morris parallelogram and you must know all the structures that you will cut through when you approach posteriorly. So I hope all of you have understood. Thank you.